My name is Sharif Mohammed Khan. Um, I was born in Rwanda from Muslim parents. My father is from Pakistani background and my mom is from Rwandan background. Um, both my parents, alhamdulillah, they are Muslim. Uh, my mom, she come from a non-Muslim family, but before she met my dad, alhamdulillah, she was became Muslim to Shahada. And alhamdulillah, both of my parents, back in the days when I was, they were practicing, um, when I grew up with them in Rwanda, we were brought upon Islam, alhamdulillah. My dad used to show us how to pray and teach us about Islam. And after Rwanda, the war broke out. That's when we moved to Kenya, where I lived for about three years. And when I lived in Kenya, my dad, rahimullah, passed away. And from that time, basically, and my uncle from Holland, and my auntie, they adopted me and I went to live with them in Holland. When I went to live with them in Holland, um, both of them, they're not really, they are, my uncle's Muslim and my, his wife is not Muslim, so the family household was not really upon Islam. So when I went there as a young teen, as a young boy from the age of 10. I was brought up without Islam around me at all. And everybody in the neighborhood, nobody was really Muslim. So I started going to school. I was, I think, the only Muslim there, but they have no Mus Islamic values there. So from the age of 10 years old until the age of 15, I didn't really know anything about Islam. Everything that I was taught from my dad when I was young, because I, I didn't really practice it, I forgot all about it. So, um, from the age of 15 when Ramadan used to come in, because my uncle is from Islamic background, he used to say it's just fast, but it was a fast without prayer, and, and I always felt like, I didn't really want to fast. It was like, put to me, you fast, fast, but I didn't want to fast because I didn't see no point of it. Um, yeah, so that age that Islam was really gone in my whole life. But I always felt something in my heart that it was declined to Islam. Although I didn't really want to practice a religion. At the age of 16, 17, that's why me and my friends started going into uh, football hooliganism basically. That's how it started. And from that age, I started becoming rebellious and going to drugs. And basically, football became my life, and the people around football become like my brothers. That's what I started having. I had some tattoos done on my body, and and every time I went out with my friends, we was doing haram things like drinking alcohol, doing drugs. Deep in my heart, I knew that it was bad, but. Every time that I was there, I was still doing those things, but I felt ashamed a bit in the heart. From my teenage years, um, I started going to football. Um, there was a club close to my house. I would see a lot of people going there. So one time I knew one person that was old neighbor, used he used to go to football, so he invited me to go with them. When he invited me to go in them, um, I went there and basically, because he used to be a football hooliganism, he took me where they used to sit down, like their crew, they used to stand the football hooliganism. So I was there. When I was there, I saw the way they were behaving, the way they were shouting, and I was actually looking up to them, basically, because I was very young at that age and they were, they were older. So he started taking me um, almost every Friday and Saturday I used to go with him and one time I saw them they they end up going through a fight and something in me just like I saw the way the fight was going on and I really liked it I don't know why I really liked it and I really want to prove myself as well as a young person that like, you want to go with them and you want to prove yourself so that that moment I didn't really fight with them because 
because it was the first time I froze seeing the, the fight going on. And then he told me like, you're young, you shouldn't be coming this and that. But I really wanted to be part of that, that crew basically. So then I kept on coming there every weekend, wish you go. And when the next fight broke out, I had this adrenaline going in me. And something like my head, sh like my eyes got shut down and just, I just went into a solar and I had this adrenaline. And after that, they gave me like, like a name, like a, like a name it used to be called like uh, Pete. That's like my name basically. And it's like you got a rank, not a rank, but you got recognized. So from then that, that I went into the football hooligans that was becoming my life. And every week that we used to go partying and we see maybe another, we go to the different cities, we see other clubs, we used to always get in a fight. That's just became my life. And that's basically from the age of 16 up until the age of 19, 20, I was just involved in every, every weekend. I was just about football, football, football. With football, basically, drugs came into place as well. Drugs and alcohol. Oh. And that became just my whole life. And when me living with my uncle and auntie, they knew what I was up to, but they didn't really know that I was up into drugs or deep like that into football. Until one time the police came into my door and they told basically that they want to speak to me regarding an incident I had with the football hooliganism. And yeah, so. They spoke to my uncle and auntie, they would be upset, but it didn't stop from there. It just continued from there until I arrested a couple of times for fighting. And I didn't handle, I didn't do that much time. Because at that time I was studying, I saw youth work. But while I was studying youth work, I was busy with those, busy with those, busy with other things. And I was really not a role model for the youth. So that's why um, the judge let me off this time. And at the time, my mom, she came to live in Holland. She came to Holland with my, she was married at the time, with my stepdad. And because they were practicing Islam, they came to me sometimes and tell me about Islam. But I didn't really want to listen to it. And the funny thing is basically is, I didn't, wanna, I didn't want to have anybody to know that I was Muslim, part of the crew. Because I felt ashamed like, they're going to ask me, why are you drinking? Why are you doing drugs while you're a Muslim? Because Muslims are not allowed to do those things. So I didn't want them to ask me those questions. So every time somebody asks my name, I'll give them a street name. <laughs> so they don't know that I'm Muslim. And because I used to have the tattoos and everything. So they don't really think I was Muslim anyways. Um, yeah, so I was so deep into football hooliganism that I actually had some tattoos made, uh, tattoo made on my arms. Um, I started going deep into the drugs as well, using some very legal drugs that only you could see in football hooliganism or parties that we used. Um, I got actually attached to certain, certain drugs that every time we go football, I had to take those drugs just to have that, that to have that, that, that feeling basically that you're invincible, you can do anything. And, and, and at some point as well, like somebody asked me to start selling drugs for them. And, but I was really into that selling drugs like that. My, my thing in the football hooliganism was more about fighting and they just taking the drugs and they're fighting and fighting. Um, and, and basically, yeah, because of even football, everybody around you is drinking. And drinking was just a normal thing. So I used to drink, basically, drinking started from a Thursday until Sunday. I would just drink alcohol, just drink, 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 drink. And, um, but I knew in, deep in my heart, it's just haram what I'm doing, but I, do, I didn't care. But I, I felt something, I didn't care. So, um, yeah, I started drinking, I used drugs, and I used to go to parties, and I used to go, most of the times, the party I used to go to, with the football hooligans, we used to be hardcore parties. You only see skinheads, like only white people that only skinheads. I was the only black person that was in that party, actually. And, but because I was with my, with my gang, basically, as they call a gang, I used to have respect from everybody. So I used to be under, under the influence of drugs, and I would be dancing there, and the hardcore music, around like skinheads, most of them were just skinheads, but I had that kind of respect with them. 
see what I mean? I had to kind of really be respect with them and I was the, literally the only black person there that was in there between the, the white white community basically. Um, as we go along, um, I started partying a lot and we actually traveled, I went with a group, small Pumbo group, we traveled to an um, island called in Greece and we just went there, we just party, we ended up fighting as well with other clubs that we met up there. Um, yeah, so basically we used to party and those things with the football club and there's some incidents that actually I saw that I became a bit terrified. There's one time we went to a city and we were just young, we were just about 20 of us outnumbered and we went to this city and that club we went to is known for the hooliganism and they've got a big name and most of them are old people basically. We went there and we was walking in the street and I remember they ambushed us. They came from out of nowhere and to see like a group of maybe about 60, 70 people running to you and you are about 20 of us are young people, keeps a bit shook at that moment. So they ran up us, they had bricks and everything and at that moment we just had to run away. We had no choice to run away. That time that I realized like it's quite a bit dangerous what I'm dealing with. You don't know what can happen. And and I had basically at that time as well, in that period, there was some other football leagues in some other city that somebody got killed as well. So those things that kind of sh shook me a little bit, but I was still into it. And this one time as well was a, ho a home game. And that a team came, about 80 of us, 80 of them, they came to us and then they started attacking us. And we had to run back into our cafe that we were in. But one of us, that like, he jumped out and started fighting them. And I don't know what happened that moment. There's so many things was going on at Adjulin that we jumped out actually and we started fighting about 80 men. And some of us got a blood nose and broken nose and some people were just lying down, knocked on the floor. Everything went so quick. The adrenaline police came and people got arrested and people just got run away. So those things that it didn't change my life, but it changed my view of football hooliganism. What can happen can actually be your death. You don't know, it can be your death. And I was still into it, but bit by bit, I stepped back a bit, a little bit, but I was still involved in certain things. My mom and stepdad, they came to live in Holland, so, but they live in different city. They used to come to visit me and they used to advise me a lot, basically, the, regarding the religion, because Alhamdulillah, my stepdad was practicing Muslim and my mom as well. They used to advise me, but I used to take the advice, like, used to go one year in, one year out. And one time that um, I went to holiday with my friends as well, um, we went, we went partying and was drinking so much that I never drank so much that night. And something is in my head like switched. I don't know what happened. The next morning, when I woke up, the first thing I've done, I don't know what happened, but I was, I think it was from Allah. I'd start praying, off the blue, out of the blue. I just, I didn't know what the kibla was. I didn't know how. I remember how to pray a little bit, but I just put uh, something down the floor. I just prayed. From that moment, I just stopped drinking alcohol. That was the time that I just I said, no, I'll never drink again. And then, so we went back and, but I wasn't really, I still was involved with a little bit of football hooliganism, but um, I was smoking at the time, still smoking. And one time my uncle and auntie, they went to hol on holiday and they told me that I had to go to stay with my mom in a different city. Uh, where my mom used to live, they used to have a lot of um, Moroccans and Turkish people. They saw more Islamic environment. So I went to stay there for the holiday and actually I enjoyed it. I have a lot of, like, a lot of massages around and... But I, I wasn't really practicing at the moment as well. And I find... Uh, 
I start getting used to the environment and when my uncle and auntie came back, I actually told them no, I don't want to come back to live with you, I just want to stay with my mom because my mom lives here and I feel more comfortable as well and they didn't say it's okay, no problem, they're okay with it and at that moment I start, I left, at that moment I actually left, start living football, football hooliganism. That's why I started living in and start a start new life, but it wasn't really upon religion as well. So I started going to school, but at that moment, at that time, I was still smoking. I was smoking, basically smoking, I mean, but smoking weed. Um, so I started going to school, I had new friends, and this time with more Moroccan, was from Moroccan background friends. Um, at that time, I used to live with my mom and my stepdad, and they used to advise me all the time, and, but I, I was listening, but not listening at the other time as well so i was still smoking and had moroccan friends and but alhamdulillah because they were moroccan friends they had a little bit islam basically though they were not practicing they had a little bit islam and so i started going to school when i finished school i start work as well but I was always hanging around the street late, smoking weed with them, and yeah, the girls were involved and those, those kind of things. And, I, and after that, I actually had their own place near my mom's house. They gave me like a small flat, and I used to have my friends used to come there and we used to smoke weed. And after a while, I started actually, I didn't have that much money. So uh, one of my friends came to me and said like, you know, we can make money in your place. So if you want, we can start. We can grow. Start growing weed there. So um, we start growing weed there, and I was just making money. And I was making money, but at the time, every time Ramadan came, though, because they were Moroccan friends, they used to fast, and I used to, cause I used to start, I start fasting with them as well. But when the fast finishes, and then you used to go back to your own things, you start smoking and those things. But though I wasn't praying. And now and then we used to go with Taraway prayer, but it was maybe once or twice in the whole Ramadan we used to go. That was already a small step towards the practice, not practicing, but towards the deen basically. That was a small step. So um, I became, not, I say I actually addicted to smoking weed. That was my thing every time. So um, I was always smoking, and when I started growing, so I was making a lot of money. and. Yeah, and at that time, um, one time actually, my stepdad, he wanted to come to my house and, and I didn't want to let him in basically because I was ashamed that he would see the weed and everything. So every time he says about how I used to come with an excuse. So, um, bit by bit when Ramadan left, I used to go back on my ways. And when Ramadan he came and I don't know what happened, but it's like, subhanAllah, Allah started guiding me. Towards the towards Islam bit by bit, I start going to praying most of the taraways, and actually, and I didn't smoke that much. I used to smoke weed after I start praying my salawat as well, and I'll leave off the weed until after Isha. So I just pray my salawat, and once Isha finishes, then I go back smoke weed because people told me that you can't pray while you're in a state of 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 drunkenness or or you're not yourself basically. So I start leaving the weed bit by bit so I just leave until after Isha and then I smoke after Isha at that time my stepdad used to put a lot of work into me and then used to tell me about Islam and I start loving Islam bit by bit and them times he used to take me to Juma so I used to start to Juma um, most of the massages that the Juma they were given to Arabic or Berbers but this particular masjid the Imam used to do after the khutbah, after the salat, salawat, he used to translate in, in Dutch. So I used to stay there and just listen to it. And it used to touch my heart a little bit, a little bit. So more I went there and more started to touch my heart. And after a while, um, I started praying my prayers. I started waking up a fajr and go to the masjid. But at that time I was still growing in my house, the weed, and I used to oh. do the haram. So um, basically, I used to wait until after Isha and I'll pray Isha and then smoke weed. 
and so more often I used to go to the I used to go only to, to Juma and pray and then just listen to the khutbah and I had I had a so I've got a brother so I used to live in, uh, in London but he was already practicing and he used to come sometimes to Holland to visit us and he used to push me to pray as well five times a day and I, I didn't really like it but I used to just pray because he just told me to pray I used just 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 for the sake of it I used to start praying with him and basically and then something in my heart just start changing bit by bit I start having a little bit iman and there's some time that I used to pray and then I used to make sujood and I was feel like I'm a munafik I'm a hypocrite I'm here worshiping my Lord but I'm still smoking and I'm still growing weed in my house I used to feel this pain in my heart like for a hypocrisy pain basically and it went on for a while feeling this pain every time and I keep on praying though and I waiting until I stay shut and I still doing what I have to do after a while and I said like hold on what am I basically doing I start reflecting on my life like what am I doing I'm here worshiping I'm praying to my Lord but I'm still doing those haram things it can't go together and I feel ashamed in my life and I feel like I am hypocrisy I'm either praying or either doing that so I had to make a choice after a while So um, one time my stepdad came to my house, I finally came to my house and he saw what was going on in my house and he advised me like, I have to get rid of these things, it's, I'm a Muslim and you're praying and this and that, you can't, do, you can't do both of those things basically and Alhamdulillah, my man and Alhamdulillah at that time was, was getting bigger and bigger and I decided like, I don't really care about this money business thing, I'm gonna either I have to choose either my, my religion, go fully 100% for my religion or just or just go back to what I was into it and and at that time I saw uh, I remember I came to England London I saw to visit my brother and I just saw the brotherhood here in London the way they I was actually a bit shocked to see so many young brothers were pressing the religion they go to the masjid I was shocked to see how it was packed the masjid was packed but not packed with the elders, just packed with young people, young, young people. I was a bit shocked, like so many young brothers and sisters who were practicing the religion, were wearing every day like the, the Islamic garments. And the sisters, they were just covering niqab. I never seen niqab until I came actually to London. And I saw brothers that were young age, about the 20s and they were married already. And they had like a family of children, so it had a very big impact on me basically to see that kind of environment and when I went back I had this feeling like no that's the place maybe I want to go to live in and start changing my life so when I went back that's the time that I decided just to stop growing what I was growing and Alhamdulillah I stopped I stopped doing uh, I stopped growing the weed in my house and I stopped smoking and when I done that I just knew my life like I, I gave up my house as well and I said I need to make a choice now either I stay in this country where it's gonna be hard for me to practice my religion or I'm gonna go to a different country just or go study my religion or go up go to London start changing my life and get married and have start a fam Muslim family well and when I gave up my house in Holland I went back to live in my mom's house and then after that, Alhamdulillah, I stopped smoking weed and I stopped, I stopped doing haram stuff. I, went to, I used to go to this masjid and I met three brothers, mashallah, they used to practice the deen. And they saw me, they started speaking to me every time because I was a regular attendee to the masjid. So when I went back to, uh, when I was back in Holland and that's when I gave up my house and I stopped smoking weed and smoked uh, growing and selling the weed I went back to my mom's to live to my mom's house in Holland and I started going to the masjid near my mom's house and I was a regular attendee to the masjid I used to go most of my salawat my iman was so high that subhanallah I used to walk to, to Fajr I used to pray Duhur and I used to pray Asr in the masjid that, that I just decided like, to start practicing my religion when I went there um, I met a couple of brothers 
and mashallah the brothers started inviting me to their house they used to do um, uh, classes in their house they used to teach, they used to teach a book called Usul Talatha so and they were following the manhaj uh, of the of the Salaf basically so I start going to them to the classes and they used to teach me the Tawheed the Aqeedah the, the, also the books of so, so Salatha, I used to go through those books. At that time, subhanAllah, my Iman just was up and I was eager to learn. But, because I was still living in Holland and my friends, where I used to, where I grew up, basically, it wasn't far from my house. They used to call me and every used to call me and used to tell me what was going on in football. And Um, at this stage, I was I was practicing. Alhamdulillah, I was eager to learn about my religion. So I was studying with the brothers, doing the Usul Thalatha, Kitab Tawheed. But on the other hand, I had my old friends. They used to live not far from me, different cities, not far from me, and they were still involved in like still hooliganism and having going clubbing and those things. So they used to call me sometimes, and and it didn't really affect me like that. But I was. Something was itching me like to go back there. But Alhamdulillah, my because man was so high and every time I was praying, I was always ask Allah to just guide me and keep me on a straight path and give me better life. So at one point I decided like I can't stay in this country because if I stay in Holland and I've got my friends, old friends that are so close to me, it might affect my religion. So at that moment I decided I'm gonna change my I need to move from where I live. So Alhamdulillah, I, I, start, I had a job, I started working, I saved some money and I left my life in Holland and I came to live in London. And I came to Alhamdulillah, I had my brother and cousin that lived here, they helped me here. And so basically Alhamdulillah, my life was just completely changed and I, bro I broke off of everything that I had in Holland. When I came here, Alhamdulillah, um, I had a job and I started practicing my deen. Alhamdulillah, I went to the massages, um, massages for khutbah, for lessons. I started learning Arabic and Quran. And I think after a year, Alhamdulillah, I got married. SubhanAllah, is the name from Allah is like, I was always making dua, Allah gave me a pious wife. And Alhamdulillah, after a year, I got married. And, and I kept on making dua to Allah, just asking Him to guide me, to give me the best in this life. And hereafter, and Subhanallah, I got married, and Alhamdulillah, I got a job. Allah gave, Allah provided me a good job, Mashallah, that I couldn't have. And at the moment, I've got three kids. Alhamdulillah. When I look, sometimes I just sit around and I just look at my life, from where I came from, and how Allah guided me to Islam, and it will make me cry sometimes. Subhanallah, that He favored me upon this religion. And since I started practicing, before I was practicing my religion, I was a person that I used to become very angry quickly. I had no patience whatsoever. When I started practicing my religion, I found peace in my heart. I became a very patient person. And I don't know where the anger went or where we went, but I stopped being an angry person that how I used to be. And I can say that my dua, Every time I used to make my dua, that my dua just got answered now. Subhanallah. Everything that I asked for Allah, everything, it didn't come straight away, but it came bit by bit. The way, I, the way I moved from my old neighborhood to my mom's house, where they were practicing the religion. The way I start um, hung around Muslim brothers that start teaching me about Islamic religion. The way I left all the drugs and the alcohol is, it just, a process I went through it with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and up until this day I just thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the guidance he gave me to live that life and subhanallah I can say that I'm I'm happiest person ever subhanallah so subhanallah what's amazing is like if when I look back on my life I saw like I used to be involved in football hooliganism drugs and and everything and compared from then and now subhanallah I'm a family man I got three wonderful children, alhamdulillah. Um, I'm working as an ambulance uh, ambulance driver, alhamdulillah, where I help a lot of people, mashallah. And, and it just makes me happy to see that the change in my life. 
and alhamdulillah is so many things that Allah changed for me and provided for me and basically in any situation I am now is subhanallah is just is is amazing it's just amazing and there's nowhere there's for nobody and for nothing I can go back to the way I was for no reason for for nothing for nobody and I pray to Allah that he keep me away from that what I was in and he protect my children from my way that what I was involved in as well because that that life is is, is a horrible life to be honest a horrible life and if you really and my advice to anybody that is in that particular situation if you really want to leave that that place you you leave, want to leave that, that that particular thing you can just ask Allah for sincerity sincere ask Allah with sincerity to take you from that place and as well implement the, the hadith of the the person that killed the 99 people that, that that's the hadith that I implemented as well when I was there when I started practicing the hadith that the person that he killed 99 people and he wants to change his life and to cut short basically somebody told me that if you really want to change your lifestyle a new life you have to leave the place you are into where the old thing happens and go to a new place start a new life and alhamdulillah I implemented that and it helped me a lot so subhanallah it helped me so that's my advice to anybody that wants to live his old life and start practicing his religion start seeking peace a peaceful life Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Brother, um, a lot of Muslims growing up in the um, West, Europe, England and so forth How can their parents help help them to stay on deen? Um, I think the way the parents can help them first and foremost is The parents need to practice the religion first themselves when they practice the religion first, the kids, they will see that religion, that they are practicing the religion, they will follow them. You can't tell your child to go pray if you're not praying yourself. So it's very important that the, the parents themselves first, they practice the religion, and then they teach your children as well to follow them basically in what they're practicing. Where is the problem of Muslims? Most Muslims are born into a, a cultural Islam where there's not much studying, there's not much teaching from the father or mother. Uh, what problems does this lead to when People like they do Ramadan just because everyone else is it. They do eat because everyone else is it. But really, they don't really know anything about Tawheed or Kido or any, anything like this. Like, what is the problem? What, what is the problem of just being a cultural Muslim? Um, I think is a big problem being cultural Muslim because in Islam, just in general, you can't do an act of worship if you don't know how to do it or the way you do it. So knowledge is very, very important in Islam. To know how to do the knowledge according to the to the Sunnah of the Prophet So um, this is very sad. Unfortunately, is the way they the reason why it's just a cultural thing is the parents most of the time don't really practice the religion. They don't really get the knowledge as well to teach the children. So I think that it comes most of the times is the youth the way they really lack in in the practice of the religion or seeking the knowledge is because of their parents Sahara. that's the way i see it basically what advice would you give someone who's really deep into drinking smoking uh, the opposite sex zina and they don't believe that it's possible for them to practice they just believe i'm just mentally and physically too weak to ever practice in the, in, in the west it's, it's impossible. They believe it's for what? Is is that true? Is that it's impossible for anyone to practice, or can it be done? Or it's definitely not impossible for nobody to practice. If you can, everybody can practice, no matter what situation you're in, and you can always practice. It's just, it's just you have to work hard yourself towards that step of practicing. You have to be willing from you, deep in your heart that you want to leave the alcohol, the zina. You want to willing to leave it. If you're not willing to leave it, then it's always going to be hard for yourself to practice. 
the first step you have to do is leave the environment you're in. That will always make things easy on yourself. And move to an Islamic environment where people around you are always practicing. Because if you are around people that are practicing your religion and you're there drinking everything, you're going to feel definitely away from doing those things. You're not going to quickly be drinking while if you've got brothers around you that are talking about the religion and you're sitting there drinking, you're not really going to do it. So move from that environment where in, you're in, which makes you harder to practice religion, and move to a better environment where is Islam around you. That will definitely help you. That's definitely one push that will help you to practice your religion. Uh, last two questions. What advice have you got to someone who's uh, a Muslim, it seems strange, but a Muslim deep into the hooligan lifestyle? Smack like fighting people, breaking bottles over people's heads, stabbing people, kicking people's heads in. <laughs> what advice would you give to a Muslim that this is part of their daily week, like weekend? Um, if it's a Muslim, the advice to a Muslim, I would say first of all is, you know, you know, hooliganism is about fighting, and anything can happen. As a Muslim, fear the state you're going to die into. You know, you're Muslim. Are you really prepared to die in a state of? hitting somebody in a set of being under influence of alcohol or being killed by for no reason basically so fear in that state because Allah can take your soul anytime anywhere so you don't want to die in that state of being being in a hooliganism and being in hooliganism you got a lot of chance of being killed that's one thing you should know that because you're fighting so anybody can hit you with anything and it could be a final blow so just fear in the state that you will die in. Uh, what advice would you give to people that are smoking weed, selling weed and stuff and they say, oh, it's nothing because I'm minding the drug, it's not really harming anybody, it's not really too, there's nothing too bad about them. What advice would you um, give to people? Advice to the person that's selling it first is, you're harming another person, intentionally or unintentionally, you're harming an, on that person. And that, you're going to be asked of your Mulkiyama, that you harm the person and you can actually even kill a person without, without even knowing it so for selling it you don't know what you're doing to other person's life and you can even make uh, um, you can even like the person may have kids and wife you can even destroy his whole family household and for the person that's smoking it smoking weed it just destroy your 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 your, your brains and your mind of thinking and sometimes make you paranoid as well yeah. So is 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 you don't want that, and especially if you got kids, would you want your kids to be there smoking weed the whole time? You don't want that for your children. So smoking weed this is the thing that you just want to leave because you just end up just destroying your whole body and your system of life as well. Since I've come to Tawhi and I've been about to complain to the Senate and everyone else, I know who I am. I'm the creation of the Lord.